welcome all welcome back all of you uh, for this uh, second session on day 4 uh, so i think uh, we had a good uh, uh, overview and an energetic talk by uh, dr martha in the morning on lithium on uh, uh, lead acid batteries he talked a whole lot in depth about lead acid batteries and how um, it can still uh, be researched upon to further improve upon its performance even after 150 years so this after uh, the second talk is by uh, dr pratay basak so um, let me just introduce uh, him uh, he did uh, a dual masters degree one in chemistry from university of roorkee one in materials technology from um, iit uh, bhu and then uh, with uh, further curiosity he went on to do a post -doc -doc or doctoral study rather on the solid polymer electrolytes at iict hyderabad i think after finishing up his um doctoral degree i think uh, he uh, actually spent time at two premier uh, labs in the us as in the postdoctoral position one is uh, uh, georgia institute of technology uh, georgia tech as you call it and the other one is lawrence berkeley national lab and nbnl uh, both of them are premier places to actually carry out uh, especially energy conversion and storage uh, research um, and then um, he came back to india with the uh, ramanujan fellowship uh, the esteemed ramanujan fellowship and uh, i think after that uh, he has spent his, all his time since 2009 at iicd hyderabad and he is presently a principal scientist at iicd hyderabad and uh, he works in the areas of organic polymer electrolytes for uh, uh, energy storage slash conversion devices he works on proton exchange membranes and uh, uh materials as well so does uh, combinatorial studies and high throughput characterization of thin film materials so with that i think uh, uh, dr pratyek basak the floor is uh, open for you thank you dr pravin uh, dr ravi for this kind invitation uh, i will try to share my slides deck now and see if it works for me Yes, we can see your slides now. Okay, is it in the slide show mode? Uh, yes, started. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, good morning, everybody. I know that uh, all of the participants have been uh, in this program for the last three days uh, in energy conversion and storage devices, and most probably uh, you all have heard. a lot about uh, how the next generation devices are going to be uh, mostly uh, green and energy efficient and i thought uh, although you might have heard uh, a lot about uh, how the green sustainable energy uh, resources have come into play in the recent times uh, although i have been given the charge of electrolytes for next generation energy storage applications i'll briefly deal uh, a little bit of the background uh, on which uh, we are motivated to work in this particular field uh, it's it's good always good to uh, have a bigger canvas on which uh, you start printing a dot or paint a, a brush stroke so just to give you a background i am from indian institute of chemical technology so greetings from my institute to all the participants you are always welcome to visit our institute post the pandemic situation of course and we are also a part of academy of scientific and innovative research uh, that's a institute of national importance with uh, the listed uh, one and we undertake uh, research uh, in terms of uh, giving doctoral degrees and intake degrees as well so with this uh, small thing uh, long back uh, richard smalley of rice university had listed down the challenges that face the humanity in the 50 years to come and we are somewhere in the middle of it and still energy is on the top of the chart and the reason primarily is that uh of climate change as uh 
multiple warnings these days are being issued by scientists that global warming is a uh, thing that we cannot uh, avoid anymore now. Uh, we need to move towards uh, sustainable energy resources because energy that we consume uh, has a very, very huge carbon footprint uh, that is causing global warming. And there is no doubt that we as human beings have contributed to it. So uh, the World Economic Forum, as well as many, many countries are participating in it uh, in a very, very serious way. Uh, this is a slide I love a lot. Uh, I collected it a long time back. Uh, it's a composite image of the night for our planet Earth uh, over a period of two years. So they, they did it for almost 200 days uh, over the two years period when they got the night sky free from the satellites. And you can see that the night lights of Earth are very, very visible. What I have marked in these yellow cycles are the developed countries that uses the maximum of the uh, energy that we produce globally. And uh, they are the North America, the Euro, European Union, and uh, the Japan and uh, the Chinese uh, Korean uh, Delta. So these five in pink are the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. If you see the density of lights there, we are not doing badly either. Uh, we, we are a large consumer of, of electricity and probably as a growing nation, we will keep on in increasing our energy demand in the coming years. And uh, the global prediction uh, of energy usage and utilization right now, uh, although it is around 15 terawatt or so back in 2019, it will probably grow to 30, 32 terawatt by 2050. So uh, just to give you a um, snapshot of what it means, uh, on the left hand side, uh, there is a, a bar plot which shows uh, the OECD and non-OECD countries uh, in the blue and the red. So what OECD means is uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which uh, mainly has uh, the developed countries in its fold. We belong to the non-OECD countries so far. Uh, and what I want to show you or highlight is that the non-OECD countries, the energy demand is projected to increase over the next uh, couple of decades. And on the right hand side, that's uh, the energy balance between all the different kinds of fuels that we use, coal, natural gas, liquids. We use an energy mix. So uh, for power projections, uh, they are going to climb up very, very uh, drastically, no doubt about it. Uh, this is a projection of 2030, but uh, there is still uh, a lot of uh, catch up to do by the renewables and the nuclear uh, because uh, the global demand projections are so high that uh, these could continuously affect uh, what we are going to see uh, the world over. Just uh, the background of the climate change in mind, since industrial revolution, the carbon dioxide uh, loading in the atmosphere have kept on creeping up and as you can see uh, some uh, latest data it is around 415 ppm in our atmosphere so a uh, greenhouse effect uh, has started to show its uh, role on the glacial melting antarctic and arctic ice melting uh, people are predicting uh, that we would be probably uh, uh, Arctic cap less by 2030, if you are following the news. So it, it's, a, it's a bad situation to be in, and uh, we don't want to be responsible for that. So there needs to be certain corrections uh, that needs to be made both societally, economically, and globally for everybody. And uh, 
since uh, you all are students of science, maybe sometime it is good to see a few documentary movies. Uh, I here list two uh, movies that impressed me in my early days. One is An Inconvenient Truth, uh, where filmmaker Davis Guggenheim follows Al Gore, once upon a time a presidential candidate for the US. He served as a vice president. So it, it's a uh, notable lecture by him, which has been documented. It has won two Academy Awards. And this was followed by Leonardo DiCaprio in 2007 with another documentary, The 11th Hour. It's always good if you can have access to uh, these two movies and have a look at it. it Maybe your vision towards uh, uh, global climate change and energy securities and all that will change. So uh, we, we need to have um, to address many primary issues and challenges and they have implications globally, societally and economically and it is going to affect us all uh, and there is no doubt about it. So uh, we, as early we act, uh, the better we are. So uh, as I say, this was the big canvas on which uh, probably I am trying to play a role there. Uh, as a very, very uh, small member. My motivation towards working in this particular area is these particular devices, uh, which are which have been touted as the green energy conversion and storage devices. They are the dye-sensitized solar cells or third generation solar cells, as you might know. One is the proton exchange membrane fuel cells or uh, low temperature fuel cells. They're popularly called, and the third one is the lithium ion rechargeable batteries. So, uh, these three uh, have become popular, some of them have become commercialized and have been quite successful over the years. Uh, particularly, lithium ion battery we know is the workhorse for all the portable devices that we use today, and uh, the proton exchange membrane fuel cells, uh, several. Uh, big vehicles uh, these days are flying on the road uh, or on trial basis to uh, see the feasibility of these things. They work with hydrogen. What I want to highlight here in particular is all these three electrochemical devices use electrolyte, which is sandwiched in the middle. And they have a role to play, a very important role to play, uh, to carry the ionic charge from the cathode uh, that towards the anode or the anode towards the cathode, depending on whether you are charging or discharging the device. So uh, it's a key component. And uh, for the device performance and lifetime, that determines uh, how long you can use the device and how little maintenance it needs, uh, electrolyte plays a very, very definite role in this particular um, devices, or I will say all electrochemical devices that uses electrolyte. So uh, although we, we may assume that uh, electrolyte uh, has rather um, a, a very small role in the research area, it plays a very, very important role under the operational conditions. Just to brush up our textbook definition of electrolytes, uh, any material that can dissociate into its ionic components when it is in solution or in molten state to provide an electrically conducting medium. So true, NaCl in solid doesn't conduct any electricity. It is an insulator, but NaCl or sodium chloride, uh, our day-to-day -day salt, when you uh, put it in a water, it dissociates into Na plus and Cl minus, or if you melt it at 800 degrees centigrade or so, it is a molten salt. Again, you form ions, which are capable of carrying the charge uh, and hence conduct electricity. So uh, the, the mechanism of conduction, especially in these kind of ionic system, and there is a difference between an electronic conductor and an ionic conductor, uh, is that they have uh, mass transfer involved along with the charge transfer. And depending on the dissociation constant, they can behave as a strong or a weak electrolyte. And uh, if you know about it, uh, they have immense biological significance. 
we all have water in our body along with uh, good uh, electrolytes that help our neurons and muscles to function. Our skin can sense, uh, we can react. Uh, everything that is on the potassium sodium channel is balance of the electrolyte. So anything goes wrong in our potassium sodium balance, uh, we can turn lunatic, so as to say. So uh, electrolytes form an integral part of all these devices and the materials commonly used so far, uh, mostly in the conventional batteries, are mostly strongly acidic or alkaline, or uh, in certain as in cases, as I will keep on discussing, low molar mass organic solvents. So uh, I believe you have heard Dr. Martha today morning to uh, give you a brief on uh, lead acid batteries, and they use uh, primarily uh, water-based acidic uh, systems or uh, alkaline systems, as it may be the case. But uh, I will probably touch upon a bit more on the lithium-ion batteries and those kinds like those. And uh, they preferably use low molar mass organic solvents. Uh, before I go into that, the batteries is nothing new. Uh, so as to say, it has a 200-year-old history, uh, more than 200-year-old history, started somewhere in 1800 uh, with the Voltas pile and then to Daniel cell. And the change or the um, major change in the industry uh, was definitely uh, the lead acid battery, which is still a workhorse for many, many applications, right from uh, car, truck batteries to uh, our inverters uh, in the laboratories, in the home. Um, but in 1990, the revolution uh, came in terms of lithium battery, uh, which Sony introduced for the first time. And this particular battery uh, changed the way how we handled our portable devices. The devices started to become smaller, um, more easier to handle uh, because the battery battery packs uh, have huge charge density, energy density that we can uh, carry along with us without um, much uh, trouble. So our laptop or um, mobiles all became smaller, smarter, and one of the reason primarily is uh, the lithium batteries that came into the market. So. Uh, just an overview of the lithium ion battery. There are many, many different cathodes, anodes that are in the market. I have taken this particular thing from uh, a source uh, which I have mentioned. So we, we have different specific energy density and volumetric energy density depending on which kind of material uh, we are choosing to make the battery. So uh, I, I understand uh, most of you would not be familiar with these uh, uh, abbreviations. And just to uh, give you a feel about it, LCO stands for lithium cobalt oxide. Uh, NMC stands for nickel manganese cobalt oxide. NCA stands for nickel cobalt uh, kind of aluminum kind of system. LMO stands for lithium manganese oxide. LFE stands for lithium iron phosphate and LTO stands for lithium titanate. LTO uh, is uh, mostly used as an anode, uh, while uh, other than the carbon-based anode systems, and all the rest of them are used as cathodes. So they make, uh, depending on the choice, uh, the batteries uh, more energy dense, uh, or uh, they uh, carry uh, more specific uh, energy in terms how the manufacturer choose to give you the product that you want to use. So these kind of plots uh, that we, we are uh, familiar with, um, I am not sure how, how many of you are familiar with, but these kind of plots may look complicated uh, at times, but they are known as Ragoon plots. And uh, we always refer to these kind of plots because we want to understand where we can play around when we do some research. So in the bottom bottom uh, part of the thing, uh, what we can see 
is the marked in green and yellow. These materials are all used as anodes. And those on the top, top hand sides, most of them are used as cathodes in lithium ion batteries. And as you can see, most of them are mixed metal oxides of lithium uh, used as cathodes. And uh, graphite or carbon has been the workhorse of lithium ion battery for long now. Uh, they are popular anode material. But the holy grail is to use lithium metal uh, as the anode or no anode as such. Uh, just the metal gets deposited uh, directly on the current collector. So if you have a lithium metal, you can see the capacity of the battery it can be very, very high and the potential that you can uh, get is also very, very high. Most of the batteries have uh, working potentials more than 3.4 volts and above. So, so people are trying to make high voltage batteries uh, when you talk about uh, lithium ion batteries. And that's the reason why uh, you, you see these arrows here. These are the basically uh, the difference in the potential between the cathode and the anode that gives you the working potential uh, which you can use. And since lead acid battery, uh, it, it, it's, it's almost double that of lead acid battery, the battery size can be reduced uh, to a, a very a manageable extent. So having explained this, uh, we should also understand that right now in the marketplace, probably you would be using one of this kind of battery technology, whether it is lithium nickel cobalt aluminum, uh, lithium nickel manganese cobalt, or lithium manganese spinel uh, LMO, or lithium titanate based battery, or lithium iron phosphate based battery. So uh, the, these kind of plots are known as spider charts. Uh, they look like spider, and depending on how high or how low uh, it is in terms of cost, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, as a consumer or as an industrialist, look into it, uh, how best we can uh, give the battery, whether it is low cost, high specific power density and specific energy density, or it is high cost and high specific energy and specific power. Uh, every battery has a different uh, application area. It may have an application in defense where cost doesn't matter, but performance matters. It may be in the area of consumer market where you need to uh, give cheaper products for the consumers to allow them to buy it more easily. And it can be also applied in elsewhere in very, very uh, abusive conditions, whether uh, where the uh, means temperature or the pressures are quite different. So depending on where you want to apply your battery, uh, one single chemistry doesn't help. So you have a wide variety or range of materials that can be used as products in different areas. So if I look at the uh, industrial batteries uh, that um, these different companies have used, whether it is Toyota, Panasonic, Hitachi, and Sanyo, and things like that, uh, what I wish to highlight that other than cathode anode, which I talked about so far, we have the electrolytes, uh, which do play an important role. And as you can see, till date, all of the electrolytes used are liquid in nature. Whatever the shape of the battery may be, whatever the cathode and all the industry we do use, most of the electrolytes that have has been used till date uh, are liquids with uh, one or two exceptions where you are hearing about lithium polymer batteries where they use uh, a, a kind of polymeric gel. Uh, it's, it's yet to uh, go move into something else in the commercial place. And as I told you, depending upon your application area, the battery requirement and the battery specification for the electrolytes can change drastically. In most consumer electronics uh, area that we use, we use an electrolyte that's 
actually serves you in between uh, minus 20 or uh, to plus 30 or plus 40 at the best because if, if you are uh, you have a usage temperature higher than that probably sometimes you need cooling conditions uh, to keep the battery cool or maybe heating conditions where you want the battery to be heated up uh, so that you can use it say you you have a battery and you have gone to a very very cold part of the country where the temperature has fallen to minus 30 degrees centigrade your battery stops working so the device should have a facility where uh, it can warm the battery up and uh, it can allow you to function and then you can use your device so uh, if you are using a hybrid electric vehicle you don't want your car to stop uh, when your engine has warmed up or say you, you are driving in a snow uh, terrain then you need your battery uh, to remain warmed up there and and the electrolytes uh, that need to respond to this kind of demand the range of where it should allow you to function uh, should be uh, changed whether it is military whether it is uh, say in space application where the temperature is very very cold minus 80 degrees centigrade or below you need a different kind of electrolyte even for fabricating the battery the, so depending on where and which application you are targeting the cost uh, of the electrolyte the nature of the electrolyte uh, the composition of the electrolyte can change uh, means very drastically so i will give you a few examples of uh, the modern electrolytes that are being used or preferred and uh, this is a typical organic electrolyte um, that people use and it is preferred mostly in southeast asia uh, japan korea china where uh, taiwan where most of the batteries these days uh, lithium ion rechargeable batteries are being made uh, or fabricated these days there have been big industries to make lithium ion batteries and uh, they are primarily made up of ethylene carbonate and a mixture of diethyl carbonate uh, both are uh, usually in one is to one uh, volume by volume ratio with lithium hexafluorophosphate as the salt so we need to understand that when we say it is an electrolyte you have a component which is a salt that dissociates into uh, carrier ions lithium plus and pf6 minus and then for it to dissociate the medium should be very very polar because other than that the ionic compound lithium hexafluorophosphate or any other salt so as to say won't dissociate into its ionic components so if you are willing to use a organic electrolyte the organic medium should be very very polar and this polarity you can see that uh, there are heteroatoms oxygen atoms carboxyl groups carbonate groups uh, as nitrile groups groups like those uh, help you to give uh, polarity uh, in the medium and helps you to dissociate the salt also if you see on the right uh, bottom corner i have mentioned uh, h2o less than 15 ppm when i say that that means our electrolyte should be very 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 dry most uh, most of the time uh, whenever we are handling systems outside in the open atmosphere materials tend to absorb a little moisture water the so water content in these kind of system especially when you are talking about lithium ion battery and sodium ion battery uh, we we don't prefer to have water in this kind of system as we know lithium ions sodium ions are very very reactive very sensitive to moisture if, if those things happen then lithium immediately reacts sodium immediately reacts to form unwanted uh, things that uh, leads to the failure of the batteries so what we need to do is when we prepare the electrolytes the conditions should be very very dry it has the very stringent conditions have to be maintained if it is not dry then after making the electrolyte we need to make them dry by following certain protocols and hence the special equipments and uh, fabrication rooms are required to handle 
this kind of system. And this is just to make you aware that means for lithium ion batteries, uh, electrolyte is not uh, that easy to handle or, or, or use. <coughs> Continuing on the other uh, similar electrolytes, this is preferred in North America. Instead of diethyl carbonate, they prefer to use ethyl methyl carbonate. And if you see, again, we people have been using carbonates as the polar medium, and the boiling point and the freezing point determines how good those electrolytes would behave in low temperature and high temperature condition. And the polarity of the medium should be high enough so that one molar concentration of the salts. Uh, one or 1.2 molar concentrations of the salt can be achieved in the system and uh, then the freezing points determine how low it can go and so uh, there should not be any a, a, it should take any temperature fluctuation without salting out or precipitating out of the salt from the system and the system needs to be very very dry so not only not only the Solvation of the salt is important. It is also important that the conductivity of the system, uh, ionic conductivity of the system should be high and within the usable range. And I am putting here an electrolyte uh, commercially sold by Merck under the trend and select light just to show you that specific conductivity of the system should be preferably within this range around 1 millisiemens per centimeter at minus 20 degree centigrade to approximately 20 millisiemens at 60 degree centigrade uh, for batteries to work well. So uh, this should be uh, a benchmark for us when you are making an electrolyte that this kind of conductivity range should be achieved in a liquid electrolyte and then only probably it is feasible for making the battery, assembling the battery, and then the battery can function well without any problem. So apart from these um, things which I already mentioned about in terms of electrolyte, not just lithium hexafluorophosphate, but over the years, many, many different salts have been tried. So just to tell you why we look for different salts. If you have observed, lithium is a very small cation and we are not using lithium chloride, which is probably the cheapest of the salts. Chloride ion is rather small when compared to hexafluorophosphate or any of these anions that you are looking into. This trifluorosulfonamide, this oxalatoborate, these kinds of anions are very, very big in size. So why we choose that? We choose that because their lattice energy is low. They can go into salvation very easily. Apart from the fact, they are electrochemically very stable. Fluoride-based systems or perchlorate-based systems may not be electrochemically stable. So, so when we talk about lithium-ion battery, since the voltage range is quite high, we need a electrochemically stable systems, preferably these systems should have electrochemical stability or anionic stability better than 4 volts at least for the systems to work. Otherwise, we are, when we are talking about rechargeable batteries, as we keep on going through multiple cycles of charging and discharging during our process, we will keep on losing the battery efficiency uh, there, there will be heavy uh, loss in how the electrolytes go through the system and uh, there would be pseudo reversibility and all that and slowly over a period of time the battery would fail and uh, as a consumer I would never wish that. So alternate salts are also tried although uh, lithium hexafluorophosphate till date is uh, the industrial workhorse. So most of the systems have lithium hexafluorophosphate in it, but sometimes for special applications, these kind of other salts are also preferred. 
So apart from salt and the solvent, many electrolyte additives are also used uh, and I have just shown the chemical structures here. Some of them are actually used for the anodic protection and stabilization and some are used as cathodic protection and stabilization. See, when we use lithium ion batteries, one particular aspect that we need to keep in mind is that lithium is very, very reactive. And when lithium ions come in contact with the active cathode or anode, sometimes they have unwarranted reactions, side reactions. So the side reaction in the initial cycles of formation, when you just make the battery and you are, before you put it in any device, you basically go through formation cycles to make it a stable system. So during that period, you actually go through three or four cycles to which we call as formation cycle. And during this time, some interfacial layers forms on the anode and the cathode. And this interface layers actually help you to protect the cathode or anode from the electrochemical degradation or spalliation or exfoliation. And sometimes this solid electrolyte interface that we call it, this interface also helps in smooth charge transfer across the boundaries of a solid from the liquid. So in the liquid, the charges moves relatively faster when it gets intercalated or inserted into the cathode or anode it comes towards a roadblock because of the change of uh, the phase from liquid to solid. Definitely it is slowed down a little bit. So if there is an interface here, it basically softens the uh, movement across the boundaries of a liquid to solid and hence we call it a solid electrolyte interface. Now this solid electrolyte interface has a very, very important role to play. If it is not stable, then what happens? Every time you try to charge or discharge the system, this interface can dis dissolve or reform. And when it dissolves or reforms, it basically consumes your electrolyte material. And over a period of time, your electrolyte can dry off or lose all the cations or anions from the system, and your battery would become a dead, dead system without any use and you have to throw it. So these kind of interfacial layers have a very, very important role to play in. And this is particularly what the composition you are playing with in the electrolyte. So so apart from these uh, anodic protection or stabilization agent. You have cathodic protection and stabilization agents as well. There are many, many chemis chemical uh, structures that I have shown, and uh, one can choose as they like depending on certain thumb rule. Do you want uh, to restrict flammability in the system? Then you choose one kind of uh, additive. If you want to increase the temperature stability, then you uh, use one or combination of these additives and things like that. So other than those things, you use many other solvents and additives to lower the temperature of use. Most solvents, when they go below the G zero or uh, minus 10 or minus 20 degrees centigrade freezes. So to uh, restrict the freezing, you can add a small amount of uh, these kind of solvents, ethyl butyrate, methyl butyrate, alipolytrite, sulfolane, etc., to decrease the freezing point of the whole system of the electrolyte. So, with this, more or less, I have covered the liquid electrolyte parts, but then uh, probably I will try to give you a flavor of what. Uh, my research focus had been in the recent years and uh, I'll try to share with you uh, how I have approached the problem, why I have approached this particular problem and what are the challenges involved in it.
how we characterize the system, what kind of equipments uh, we use to do this kind of characterization, and try to give you an overview of uh, the challenge of the electrolytes for next generation lithium ion batteries because uh, research has to continually uh, keep on uh, striving to give you a better performance, better device, better everything. So, since I have been talking on liquid electrolytes, uh, my interest has been initially to study how these liquid electrolytes behave. And I look at the chemistry of these things uh, with great detail. And what we find is that liquid electrolytes uh, with time do degrade, do break down, do polymerize. And during all this process, <coughs> it leads to the battery failure or short circuit. So, degradation and or unwanted byproducts leads to performance decline and self discharge of the system. What I mean by self discharge is if you leave a battery over a period of time, it should not lose its capacity. So, it can, even if you are not using it, it should maintain or hold its initial capacity so that whenever you need it, you should get the function out of the battery possible. So, as I was talking about lithium hexafluorophosphate, lithium hexafluorophosphate, even in the presence of little bit of moisture, can uh, lead to uh, formation of very, very acidic component, HF, hydrofluoric acid, that leads to corrosion of the anodes or cathodes, or it can, the FPF5 can lead to ring opening polymerization of the electrolyte solvents and this can lead to increasing the viscosity of the system and slow down the charge transfer mechanism in this kind of system. And we had followed these through various different techniques. Uh, on the left bottom hand side, this is a typical uh, GC or gas chromatography analysis of the system that how the electrolyte degrades over time, what are the speciations uh, that happen uh, because of this kind of degradation and how over a period of time the interfacial and the bulk impedance can keep on increasing uh, with temperature and so on. So, so these kind of problems uh, tend to occur uh, when we have not formed uh, a lithium battery um, that have uh, electrolytes which has been properly made, uh, which are not dried properly and things like that. So, there are key engineering issues associated with this kind of system. If, if you have uh, seen uh, certain battery failures, one of the main reasons uh, is the formation of these kind of finger-like structure, as you can see. And these we call as dendrites. So, this is one particular region. That even though the holy grail uh, is to use lithium as a metal, as anode, so that we can get high specific uh, energy density. Uh, we don't use it just to avoid the battery safety. What happens is that uh, in the battery over multiple charge discharge cycle, <coughs> these kind of fingers grow and slowly it shorts, I mean, touches the other part of the electrode on the opposite side and then it shorts. When it shorts, uh, it can give you a explosion or uh, a, it can catch fire as it happened for Dell. Uh, if you recall, in 2006 during conference, uh, there were four or five uh, Dell laptops which caught fire. And then Dell had to recall four million laptop batteries uh, just because uh, five uh, Dell computers caught fire. Uh, so um, these were again supplied by Sony and it had a means uh, very, very bad um, name for Sony during that time. So there have been airline incidents. In airline, there are uh, those APU battery packs, uh, which uses uh, lithium ion batteries. And then uh, four major accidents uh, were averted because of, of course, the pilot sensitivity. And most recently, I'm sure you remember this case that uh, nobody was allowed to carry Samsung Galaxy S7 phone when 
they went to the airport because there were serious concerns about fires and explosion and uh, Samsung had to pay a price for that in 2016. So <clears throat> although lithium ion battery uh, had been the workhorse in the portable devices, uh, several issues have plagued it uh, in terms of safety. Uh, so continual research and uh, is needed to avoid, avoid these kind of uh, incidents. So most of the failures and setbacks, although they have been assigned to poor cell design, cell manufacturing flaws, external abuse of the cell, uh, poor battery pack designs and things like that. Uh, cell thermal runaway, uh, rapid cell heating, however, uh, can occur primarily because of when the electrolyte is not uh, that good, not that dry. Uh, people uh, occasionally uh, take electrolyte as a mundane component of the system, but then you, you need to realize that if it is not dried fully, then uh, lithium uh, can play havoc on the system. So uh, this is all uh, that I had to talk about liquid electrolytes so far, but then uh, even though it is commercially already available in the market, um, all these devices we are using do carry these systems. What as a researcher I am trying to do is highlight the drawback of these particular liquid electrolyte system. And when I uh, chart out those drawbacks, I say that uh, liquids as liquids, they are prone to leakage and evaporation over the time and it is understandable. As organic liquids, they are likely flammable. And uh, when they uh, get into the environment, uh, they are toxic products. Some of them are corrosive in nature, especially acidic or alkaline thing. And as liquids uh, in engineering design, you always encounter weight and design limitations because you have to hold a liquid uh, in some kind of vessel, whether it is uh, a bag or a pouch or a prismatic cell or a uh, battery pack you need a vessel to contain the liquid component. Cathode and anode are solids, the separator is solid, but the electrolyte is a liquid, so you need to have a vessel for packing, and that increases the weight and battery capacity. Uh, when you say um, volumetric capacity or you say um, the total capacity of the battery by weight, it all depends on which kind of packaging material you are using to hold this particular liquid. Uh, with this kind of uh, background, there was uh, in 1970s uh, a shift away from the concept of liquids as an electrolyte. And by light and element, it was shown that polymers can also behave as an electrolyte. So, but then there were certain disadvantages they encountered because polymers are macromolecules. They are not as small molecules as the liquid electrolytes. So there was always uh, a high impedance that they encountered. Um, the polymers were solid. So uh, in that solvation of ions was really, really difficult. The uh, conductivity was relatively very, very poor. So they have to heat the polymer to show that the polymer can work as the electrolyte. So Araman actually demonstrated this kind of system in 1978, where he uh, used a composition of polyethylene glycol and lithium perchlorate, and then kept the battery at almost 80 degrees centigrade to show that the battery works. But then when uh, this kind of concept was accepted by the scientific community, the advantage that were highlighted are that, that if you use a polymer, you can cast them as very, very thin films. There is no design limitation and hence you can make roll to roll batteries. Uh, you can make the batteries uh, very durable, very lightweight, corrosion resistant, leak proof. Uh, you've seen everything green and uh, they can increase the safety of the system. So uh, this, uh, became uh, a research topic for many, many scientists 
uh, all, all over the world. Uh, and it introduced the concept of all solid state batteries, uh, including me. I, 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 I was starting in my research area in those, moments, uh, in those early 90s, uh, late 90s, and I was fascinated by this idea of using polymers as electrolytes, and this became uh, one of the area of motivation for me to follow research. So, <clears throat> basically, not all polymer can behave as a uh, electrolyte or electrolyte system. Basically, what the polymer is doing is act as the medium that the carbonate solvents acted as the medium for dissoluting the salts. The polymer itself should have several properties. Over the years, uh, many, many researchers have worked on different polymers, whether it is polyethylene oxide, polyacryl nitrile, polybutyl methacryl, polystyrene sulfonate, and all those. So all of these polymers, again, like the liquid uh, carbonate solvents, have, you can see, a heteroatom in the chain. And these heteroatoms, whether it is oxygen, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, helps in the salt solvation to form a transient uh, cross link. And apart from that, the polymers need to have a low degree of crystallinity. When I say polymer should be amorphous, that means it should have low degree of crystallinity. I will try to explain the reason why it's so. When you have low degree of crystallinity, basically you promote more segmental motions in polymer. If you, if, you, if you are familiar with polymers, then you, you will know that in polymers we talk about a temperature called glass transition temperature. Be, below this temperature, your material is glassy solid and above this temperature, your material is viscoelastic or uh, it, it, it is like it has internal Brownian motion into play. Uh, if you are a student of organic chemistry, you will remember conformers or conformational isomers. That means bond rotations keep on happening at different temperatures. So if you talk about a polymeric chain, it is basically a long chain of carbon, carbon, oxygen, carbon, carbon kind of bonds. And all these bonds are always in motion at a temperature above the glass transition temperature. So if the polymer has a low glass transition temperature, that means at room temperature, all these bonds would be very, very mobile. They will keep on rotating around itself. Uh, they will keep on vibrating. So uh, they, they have an internal Brownian motion and with time, uh, they, they can change places. And this we call as segmental motion of the polymer. And the crystallinity in the system actually impedes these kind of bond motion because whenever we are talking about crystalline region of the polymer, the polymer is uh, going around itself uh, to form a lamellar like structure or crystalline domains, a well arranged system, whether it is through hydrogen bonding or uh, by some other cooperating mechanism. Uh, these kind of crystalline domains hinder the hinder or restrict the rotation or vibrational motions of the polymer. So we prefer the polymer should have low glass transition temperature and low degree of crystallinity. However, we also want that these polymers should have good dimensional stability and good electrochemical stability. The reason of dimensional stability, we don't want uh, to uh, have these polymers flow after a certain temperature. Uh, because not only glass transition temperature, polymer would do also have melting temperature. If they melt, the molecules are now uh, all randomized. They keep on moving in different directions and you lose the dimensional stability of the system. And electrochemical stability, why? Uh, as we are working with lithium ion batteries, we need to have polymers which are stable up, better than 4 volts they should not degrade. And again, as I have already explained about the small cation, large anion principle, uh, we always tend to use salts, and, and mostly they are the same salts that have been used with the liquid electrolytes, whether it is lithium perchlorate, lithium 
hexafluorophosphate, lithium trifluorosulfonamide, lithium triflate, and things like that. And mostly we prefer organic anions because they solve it faster. However, when, when you handle polymer, uh, you always have certain challenges to overcome. And the primary challenge in this particular system when you start working with Polymer because they are macromolecules in nature, their mobility is very, very, very low compared to their liquid counterpart. So, conductivity levels uh, or specific conductivity, if you remember the select light Merck uh, liquid electrolyte that I shared with you, your conductivity levels are never in the range of that of liquid electrolytes and it makes a very huge challenge before the researchers how to increase the conductivity level in this kind of matrices. And then again, when you start making device or start making uh, any, any cells to study these particular systems, you encounter interfacial impedance because it is now not a solid liquid system anymore, rather it is a solid solid system and then uh, you have a solid solid interface and that interface can create a lot of problem if there is no proper contact charge transport across the interface becomes a huge impediment apart from this if you have already heard about how the batteries are made you usually have the electrolyte that soaks the electrode that means the electrodes uh, have pores in that and the electrolyte soaks through that pore to give it a good weighting uh, and uh, give it a good interface. So if you are using a solid polymer electrolyte, uh, it would not flow and hence it would not pore fill the electrodes. So it, will, it, is a, it is a challenge to be encountered with uh, different tricks that we, we try to use when we make a lithium ion battery. And then uh, the electrochemical and thermal stability, dilution stability and processability, all that has to be taken into account uh, when we start uh, using polymer electrolyte and try to show that a device can be made. So when we start working on the polymers, we have already identified our benchmarks because we need to compete with the liquid electrolyte your ionic conductivity cannot be very, very low. It has to be in the range of 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 3 simon per centimeter inverse. And then you have you should work in certain temperature ranges. Your thermal stability should be around 150 degrees centigrade and electrical stability at 4 volts. So I'll try to, as I told you, try to give you a flavor of uh, the research that we do in our group. So we, we work with hyperbranched or interpenetrating polymer network. And the reason I work with these kind of system instead of simpler uh, polymeric system is that we, we try to form three-dimensionally cross-linked networks that has inherent entanglements. And this gives us dimensional stability. Mechanical uh, means uh, it has better mechanical uh, properties than, than relatively the blend or the copolymers. And then formation of IPNs and hyperbranches, we can also restrict the phase separation. We can combine two or three different polymers with uh, very different uh, uh, miscibility indices and interaction parameter. And uh, when we have different interaction parameters in polymers, we can end up uh, with a very, very phase separate system. As I am showing you here in the bottom pictures, uh, these are same images of uh, how a IPN is different from a blend. It is, it is, it is a, it's the same system of a polycarbonate and polystyrene coacrylonitride. nitride. Their miscibility parameters are very different. So they do not mix when you blend them. So what happens after you cast it as form of films or try to uh, form something out, mold out something out of it. After mixing, the blends would show under the microscope if these kind of island patterns and, and they would be relatively big in size. And this happens because uh, the phase separation has happened. 
But compared to this, the same system, when you form a IPN or interpenetrating polymer network, the microscopic phase separation is restricted. So what I mean to say is that you have a better homogeneity in the system. So this, this helps in the charge transport mechanism when we do uh, work with electrolytes. So that's why, that's the reason I prefer interpenetrating polymer networks than then because I can restrict the phase separation as well as the crystallinity of the system to enhance ion mobility. Or processability is also uh, very easy um, for the interpenetrating polymer network system if you know how to control the gelation and the network formation. So you have to play around with the timing of the gelation and the network formation to work on around the processability of the system. And being an IPN, I can change the components as well. I don't need to care about the interaction parameter. And hence, it offers me uh, flexibility in terms of parameter optimization. So I can vary many, many different parameters in the system and tailor the system. As I was uh, also referring to you, that the glass transition temperature and melting temperature are two critical parameters in this kind of polymeric system. Here is an example of DSC plots. What DSC means is dynamic scanning calorimetry and sorry, differential scanning calorimetry. And here we look at the heat flow. And uh, when we look at the heat flow, uh, what we try to find as a function of temperature, how the material is taking off heat uh, per unit weight. And the glass transition temperature uh, is, is usually uh, in this range, as you can see. I have shown many, many systems that we work with where we see a change in slope during a glass transition temperature. And during a melting temperature, we see a endothermic peak. And uh, this indicates how much is the crystallinity in the system. So if you see uh, most of the other, other compositions, whether it is um, B, D, E, F, I am not seeing any uh, very uh, noticeable melting peak but I am seeing the glass transition temperature, which is low. And these kind of systems are usually preferable for us. So just to give you an idea of what a semi-interpenetrating polymer network is, uh, no problem if you are not uh, very versed with polymers, but polymers are usually long thread like structures of organic molecules. They, they have a very, very large molecular weight and we can cross-link those systems in the ways we wish it to be. And all these nodes in this particular uh, cartoon representation of the polymer are the cross-links where from you have branched out and tied up with the other part of the chain. So basically it is like a fishnet when we say it is a network. And within this fishnet, if you pass in another thread, which is another polymer, basically uh, you can do that in sequential mode or in simultaneous mode. If you have a thread uh, interpenetrated into that fishnet, you will see that it is once interpenetrated and it is very difficult to release that individual thread from that fishnet. So basically it is, it is a fishnet with another thread uh, which has been interwoven within the uh, different crosslinks and it makes a three-dimensional co-continuous network uh, that is shown here uh, through this carbon representation. So these kind of polymers are mechanically very stable and we make them in the lab. As you can see, they, they, you can handle them very easily. They are very, very flexible uh, and, and uh, you can mold them very, very easily. So these are the polymer systems that we work with as electrolytes. And just to show you, these are microscopic images, electron microscopy images, how the polymer looks like uh, in the, under the microscope, uh, a scanning electron microscope. And we would like to uh, see and visualize whether there is phase separation or not, uh, uh, whether we have achieved the light morphology uh, or in these kind of systems. 
So after uh, we make those systems with the solve solvated in it, uh, please don't bother about the lots of plots that I'm showing here. Uh, I don't want to bog you down with that, but what I need to show you is how we measure these kind of things. So the primary thing is to find good ionic conductivity in the system. So we measure, we take the polymer uh, based systems, we sandwich them between two electrodes, which are usually blocking electrodes. When we say blocking electrodes, it can be platinum, it can be gold, uh, it can be stainless steel as well. So you sandwich those uh, systems between two blocking electrodes and measure the bulk conductivity of the system using an AC uh, impedance analyzer. Why, why AC and not DC is because of the reason we are dealing with ionically conducting system. If you apply a DC voltage for a certain long period of time, you tend to deplete ions, particularly when you are using blocking electrodes. You don't have an ion source that replenish the ions. So the moment you apply a voltage to measure the current, you start depleting the ions. So you basically have a polarization in the system and uh, if you try to measure the conductivity as a function of temperature, every time you measure the conductivity, you will keep on losing the number of charge carriers in the system. You will deplete the ions and your conductivity will not give you the right trend. So we use AC impedance to measure this kind of conductivity. So we use an AC signal, whether it is of voltage or of current, you can do it thermostatically or potentiostatically and measure how the system responds to it. And when you measure it, you determine from the, the specific conductivity of the system. And all these plots uh, here are, are from those kind of measurements. And if you see the bottom uh, lower part where I am saying uh, I have with your transition behavior. Basically, I have measured the conductivity as a function of temperature. And as you know, in, in, in a system, uh, when you measure the conductivity as uh, a uh, function of temperature, can follow uh, a, usually a Arrhenius behavior when it is only dependent on the temperature of the system. But if any external parameter uh, comes into play other than the temperature, then you will see a non-linearity in the system. And then we say that it, from Arrhenius, it has transitioned to a uh, non-linear behavior and it can follow any equation like Hobel Diamond function here. It can be uh, any, any other non-linear equation and that you are comfortable with. Also, we measure uh, from the differential scanning calorimetry, but last transition temperature of the system. And we try to correlate that how glass transition temperature of the system uh, allows the conductivity behavior as a function of the salt content. When, when I say this EO by uh, M mole ratio, it is actually the amount of salt content. And uh, as we know, conductivity is dependent on both mobility in the system as well as the number of charge carriers. So when we increase the salt content, ideally you should see increase in the number of charge carriers and hence the conductivity should keep on increasing. But that is not the case. In material science, we always hit a trade-off. It is always a bell curve kind of uh, thing. We have trade-off in most systems. So as we keep on increasing the salt content, we also increase the number of cross-link within the system. As I showed you, lithium goes into cross-link with different oxygen atoms. You keep on increasing the cross-link of the system, so your glass transition temperature increases, and that means your segmental motions falls, and hence you have a fall in the conductivity. So all these graphs, you can see that you keep on increasing the salt, and after a particular uh, loading of the salt, the conductivity falls very rapidly. So, uh, these were several different ways that we study in this kind of system. Uh, and another case, as you can see, that we keep on increasing uh, the different 
um, compositions that we study and then we look at how these materials behave. As you can see clearly here, this is a typical temperature versus uh, log conductivity plot. So we, we use basic, we can see that there is a curvature in the uh, fitted line. And so we say that they don't follow the linear and linear equation, but uh, you have a non-linearity induced in the system. And it, it is usually because uh, the segmental motion plays a very, very definitive role in this kind of systems. So, apart from conductivity, we also study uh, using various spectroscopic techniques. And one example here is of that of uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy, most of the time, uh, we use to determine the functional group, right? So, apart from determining the functional groups, we can always study uh, in infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy very, very quantitatively. If you, if you, if you carry out careful experiments with infrared or Raman spectroscopy, you can quantify the different functional groups that uh, you have in the system and how they change with change in salt concentration, interactions, ion distillations, uh, and, and these kind of mechanisms we study uh, for the electrolytes because it is always necessary for us to understand how the iron ion and iron polymer interactions occur in these systems to help us improve the performance in these kind of systems. So, I was talking about the conduction. So, about the, most of our studies uh, look at the ionic conduction in this kind of system. And ionic conduction in these systems are a little different than pure liquids or pure solids. So when you see pure liquids, uh, you have ionic conduction as your charge carrier is solvated in the uh, your sol solvent. You have a solvation sphere. The, the, the charge means the salt, when you put it in the medium, have dissociated. And then the ionic mobility is uh, limited by the mass of the solvation sphere. It diffuses uh, under the electromotive force. And the restriction to this is the electrophoretic drag of the solution or the frictional force. Similarly, in solid, uh, you, if you have oxygen vacancies or other vacancies created, defect sites, you have ionic hopping in those kind of systems. And depending on the number of successful jumps inside relaxation, your, your conductivity will depend on your solids. Polymers are something in between. You, you, they are neither liquid nor solids. So you, you have a interplay of both the mechanisms. Uh, you, you have ion dissociation similarly in polymers because of the heteroatom, and then uh, there is segmental mobility that helps it for the successful jumps. And your salt concentration should be such that there are enough vacant sites in the polymer for the ions to jump. And again, uh, a, a, a electrophoretic drag frictional force, apart from these two in polymer, electrostriction is uh, the uh, counter that is uh, in this kind of systems. So we, we try to study all these kind of ion transport behavior, how they follow different rules, whether it is power law equation or power law exponent, we try to fit uh, the data that we collect every day uh, through different complex uh, equations, try to fit them and then predict how the ion transport mechanism in this kind of uh, materials happen. So the, the, these are the intricacies of uh, how you want to study the particular uh, system, uh, how you want to look at the kinetics and mechanisms of conductivity in this kind of systems. And uh, we have been doing this for a fairly long time. And as you can, I'm trying to summarize here uh, for the polymer electrolytes that we work on. So over the years, we have tried several different compositions. As you can see on the right hand side, it's so basically a log sigma versus 1000 by T plot, which is conductivity as a function of temperature 
uh, in the Arrhenius way. You can see that initially when we started looking at uh, conductivity at my early days of research, I was somewhere uh, in the range of 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 9 simons uh, per centimeter. And I was nowhere close to our target conductivity of 10 to the power minus 4 to 10 to the power minus 3, uh, which in this uh, sense would be somewhere here, uh, as I have marked it in orange. So <clears throat> over the years, through different trials and studies um, by various uh, researchers uh, in my group, we have now uh, probably uh, confident about uh, hitting the um, right conductivity levels that we can possibly use for the battery applications. So uh, if you see the temperature range is somewhere between room temperature uh, to up to 90 degrees centigrade. So from 20 degrees centigrade to 90 degrees centigrade, we have fairly numerous compositions uh, of polymer based electrolyte systems that we can try and use in uh, the device. Now, these kind of systems also have other bottlenecks. I have only overcome the aspects of ionic conductivity. I have got it in the range where I wish it to be. But then, uh, even though the electrochemical stability was greater than 4.2 volts, uh, as you can see, it is almost 4.6, the ionic conductivity was good, which was predominantly ionic, so as to say 98% of the charge it, that it carries is uh, through ions. Estimated cationic conductivity, which is an important parameter for lithium ion battery, was not good. It was in the range of 0.3 to 0.3.9.4. Ideally, when you talk about lithium ion battery, you need electrolytes which can give you good cationic conductivity. Lithium plus transport number should be higher. So, we started to look at different other aspects. We tried to incorporate uh, manufactured fillers in the system. Uh, we, we showed that they do help in increasing conductivity. The nanostructured size now, whether it is 6 nanometer particle or 12 nanometer particle uh, can help you uh, look at uh, other prospects in these kind of systems. So, in, in terms of uh, morphology and phase purity, we have uh, a group working on the poly, poly these kind of systems. But, excuse me. Sorry. Okay, sorry, I think uh, I was having a phone call. Sorry to interrupt. So, with the, with, with the nano hybrids, we started playing around with brush like architectures for electrolytes to give it a uh, different dimension. Uh, we surface functionalized these systems and we got conductivities uh, which were relatively good. So um, I won't go through all these because uh, that makes things complicated, but what I want to show you is that uh, the polymer electrolyte systems, uh, we tried to capture uh, as much as we could. The electrolyte uh, stability uh, we achieved was approximately 4.7 volts. We increased the cationic transport number 0.8 volts or so. We did a lot of electrochemical studies over the years uh, and we did make some bad meets. Uh, indeed, uh, they worked well. Uh, still early days that these polymer electrolytes can be uh, used in uh, systems. We have many, many other uh, gaps to fill in. Uh, but there have been encouragement in the terms of the how the batteries can cycle and uh, do they work with commercial electrodes? Yes, they can. Uh, we have shown them over 100 cycles. Uh, it can take the abuse. We have varied the how we charge and discharge and how the Coulombic efficiency is. 
Uh, so those things we are working on still. Uh, this is this was just to give you a flavor of uh, what polymer electrolyte is and how uh, they can be used as next generation systems. This is an example other than the battery where polymer electrolyte was used and integrated into a electrochromic device uh, to give you a change in the color uh, of the system and how fast it can do it. So other than this, I know you have also looked into third generation solar cells. So we try to integrate these kind of electrolytes into third generation solar cells to give them uh, many, many hours of uh, durability. So with this, I thank uh, my collaborators and director CSI ISC, the research scholars who work with us, my funding agencies. Uh, I will now leave the floor uh, for the participants to, uh, if they have any questions, uh, I will be very, very happy to answer them and address them. Thank you. Uh, I will stop presenting. So I hope. Uh, Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm the student of Sai Santosh Kumar, sir. So the, can I, there is. Can I get you again? I missed it. You are the student yeah. of. Yeah. Sai Santosh Kumar, sir. Okay. PhD okay. scholar. Uh, yeah. Okay, Hi. sir. There is one question from the participants. I will read on it. Okay. So, sir, you have described about why we cannot use lithium metal as anode. Huh? But can we cannot control the growth of dendrites through some means like doping or alloying as you okay. do it in solder alloy? Your thoughts on that? What is your thoughts on it? It is from Srinivasan. Now, excellent question, Mr. Srinivas. Uh, it, it, it has remained a challenge, but it is not that researchers are not trying it. Uh, many, many uh, researchers have been trying to uh, use lithium uh, as a anode. Um, see, for any any material to go into the commercial space, it has to uh, overcome certain uh, demands uh, and um, those phases. So people have been trying. Yes, alloying is one part, but alloying is also one problem. So so that's one reason. Uh, uh, there there is many research reports where people have tried to use a very uh, glassy material on the lithium, which is porous, to avoid these kind of dendritic growths, but uh, with limited success. Uh, in commercial space, safety is the first issue uh, that needs to be addressed unless Researchers are convinced that the use of lithium is very safe. Uh, they don't go ahead with it. Uh, plus, most of the researchers actually try to increase uh, the uh, safety by not using lithium metal as such, uh, because handling lithium metal becomes another challenge. Plus, uh, lithium uh, is a negative export material, as you know, very rare. We have limited resources. Um, probably, even though uh, scientifically it is um, a holy grail, uh, probably it will never come into play. Maybe we'll have an anode-free battery completely. People have been researching to completely avoid the anodes, and there has been success in those kind of uh, researches. Maybe sometime soon we see a breakthrough in that field. Yes. Any other Dr. questions? Sir, thank uh, you. I will request the participants if you have any doubts, please unmute yourself and ask.
So, okay, thank you so much sir, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.